Hello everybody, and welcome back to another game design video. And uh, this is one I've been wanting to do uh, actually for quite a while, because I, I think about offense and defense in games a lot. And uh, my true belief is that defense, when allowed to get too far, when allowed to become too big a part of the game, makes the game unfun. Whereas too much offense, more or less, just makes the game more fun. So, uh, I hope by the end of this you'll agree with me, or at least see where I'm coming from. And as the recent winner of the YouTubers 2015 awards would uh, say, Mr. Doom and Darkness, uh, let's get cracking. Or let's crack on. Or whatever they say in Australia. Alright, so the best defense. Alright, so defense is something that we just naturally gravitate toward in games. If you think about the magic items you saw in 8th edition all the time, what did you see? Well, you probably saw like a spell scroll, that's defensive. You probably saw a 4-up ward, that's defensive. Probably saw something that gave you like a 1-up rerollable armor, that's defensive, right? These are the thing, or 2-up rerollable, or whatever you could do, right? These are the sort of def the items you saw every time in every list, the defensive items. Stuff that made you look like this. Just a giant, impenetrable wall of steel. You can never be injured. It's a hilarious picture. Had to use that when I found it. I have no idea what that's from. It's pretty funny, though. Alright, so let's uh, let's look around at some games and how they handle defense. So let's, let's talk about Magic the Gathering. So Magic classically has two really... There are two really classic defensive sort of plays. Both are in different sorts of strategies, but they're both defensive. So we've got your classic blue counterspell, just simply saying no, like a boss. And uh, this other card, Stone Rain. Both of these are highly defensive cards. And the history of decks that contain them is not exactly colored with a lot of people having a great time. When counterspells were cheap and plentiful, there was a long period in Magic there where blue control just reigned absolutely supreme, and it still does in some formats. Really, you've got to have it. Um, and it it's the sort of thing where your opponent thinks about something, considers what they want their play to be, taps some mana, gets their card ready, is excited to make a play, and then you just tap two blue and say, nope. Don't care how long you had to work for it, don't care what it is, I'll just say no. And of course, that's, uh, I don't think there's a lot of people who really love having their spells counterspelled. And for that period in Magic, what happened is both players played these long, slow defensive games because you, if your opponent had the counterspells and you didn't, you get into this defensive arms race. You both have to be able to counter the counter the counter to counter, right? Long, slow, tedious, not exciting. Uh, the other big one is Stone Rain. So I've got Stone Rain here, and I think it's a really big deal, because if the, if the land destruction attack is successful, what happens? Your opponent can do nothing. There's nothing worse than sitting on a grip of awesome cards and not being able to play any of them. And I, I don't think there are many decks that were hated more in the history of Magic than Stone Rain. And I think that that uh, routes to something very easily warhammery and very defensive. And that's, you know, when you get into things like points denial, right? Because what Stone Rain is doing is preventing you from playing the game, from achieving the victory condition by which the game is defined. I think you see a lot of the same sorts of behavior that can come through in Warhammer that, again, are very negative and we don't like them. But yet, they're still part of the game. Alright, let's move over to D&D. So, D&D has had an interesting history with defense, because I think the writers of the early game were very aware of this problem. Uh, even if they didn't put it in the terms I'm going to, I think they were keenly aware of sort of the psychological impact of, of missing, of having things that couldn't be hit uh, and so they created a bounded AC system. Basically, AC ran from 10 to negative 10. Don't worry about that. Just know that there's a 20-point spread. And, of course, you're rolling a d20 to hit, meaning the spread is equal to the dice. Okay? 
And what that meant is that usually you had a pretty decent shot at hitting. Uh, if you were like a high level character who would be rolling a swing a sword around a lot, you probably had a great chance of hitting. Like, really, really good. 80, 90% of your attacks could be hits, right? Which is great and fun. And the same is true, by the way, in the opposite. You'd have to get into a situation where your enemies could do that to you. But you had things like healers and other tricks up your sleeve. So you were okay with that. Now, 3rd edition allowed a lot greater variability. And you could very easily get into situations where either the monsters would only hit you on a 20, which isn't as bad because the DM's meant to lose in most cases, or worse off, you could only hit the monsters on a 20. Let's consider that. That's a 5% chance that you hit. If you're the type of character that what you do, your thing, is you hit people with some kind of weapon, that means at the start of your turn, you know that in 95 out of 100 possible futures, you do nothing. Just nothing happens. Doesn't matter how clever you are, doesn't matter whatever, how smart, how well you've prepared, 95% of your potential futures result in nothing happening. In your turn, achieving nothing. All right? Now remember that 95% number, because it's going to come back in a little later. I hope you look at that and think, wow, that sounds awful. Yeah, sure does. Sure does. Um, 5e recently brought back the bounded AC system, and I, for one, am all for it. Now I added this little picture here to point out the following, that sometimes we sacrifice maybe a bit of, of verisimilitude in favor of good gameplay. The Little Pixie and the Big Rock Man here are both as hard to hit and damage. And maybe that feels inappropriate to you. If you don't like these two, you could pick any two monsters that, that have the same AC, but maybe they shouldn't. You know, they're hit equivalently easy. Um, of course, the Little Pixie can't take as many hits as the Big Rock Man, but they're both hit equally easily. It can sometimes be the right idea in game design to get rid of all the verisimilitude, all the realism, whatever you want to call it, in favor of good gameplay, because going too far the other direction, it doesn't matter how realistic or your game is, if it's just not fun, right? And fun here is used in the broad sense across all psychographic profiles. We've talked about that in previous videos, so I'm not going to go too deep on that. So why do we care? All right, well, we care because defense, assuming that it sort of negates the thing, that is to say, you miss and do no damage or, you know, whatever happens, assuming it creates the attacker and puts them in a situation where nothing happens, as opposed to, say, a partial damage situation, right, means that your entire effort is now equals zero. That's what we've been saying, right? And if you think about it, how much do you like putting effort into something where you where the, the net effect is nothing, where you get zero out of it? And really think about that. You know, my example here is like, you made some coffee, you spill it, you don't get it on yourself, you just spill it on the ground. It just hits the ground and you're pissed. And that's like a couple cents of coffee that you could probably rebake, right? But yet it's so infuriating. Because your time, your life, your money, your whatever, your effort was wasted and had zero positive benefit to you. That's, that's about the most negative experience that humans have. And negativity bias is a thing, right? And that's where we get in this. It's important to have some negative elements in a game, to have negative experiences, because you have to have them to counter the positive. That is to say, risk, reward, all of that. So some amount of negative experience is important. But negative experiences are about seven times as impactful as the equivalent positive experience. What that means is that you stopping me from a doing what I want, making me have this negative experience of nothing, of zero, is much more impactful to me psychologically than me achieving the thing I wanted to achieve. Right? In other words, the negative of not doing it is worse than the good is of doing it. That's a real problem. 
So if you let too much defense when it gets overwhelming, it becomes the sort of thing that creates too much negativity and the negativity overwhelms the game, creates a bad play experience. Let's make it real. All right, so if both of you, and I'm gonna talk in very broad terms here, okay? So let's all try not to write in too many specifics in your head of the thing you happen to love that you think I'm bashing on. I'm not, I'm talking in extremely generic terms. If both of you, you and your opponent, are generally out for offense, what happens? Fonzie, good time. That's what happens. You get the Fonz. A. Hey. Why? Because you have a thing you're trying to do. Namely, go murder people or whatever. You're trying to hit people with your giant oversized titan buster sword. Your opponent wants to hit you with the giant titan oversized buster sword. So you go find each other and you have a nice punch up. And both of you are probably going to achieve your end to some degree, right? Now, if your opponent kills you faster than you kill them, you didn't achieve your full goal. You got to achieve part of it because chances are you killed some of them too, right? Think about the last time you had two glass cannon units in Warhammer hit each other and they both fight, say like on the same sort of initiative if this is an older edition or whatever the case. They both get relatively good bites at the apple, and they just basically vaporize each other. That's fantastic. You have both achieved what you wanted those units to achieve. What happens if you're on offense and your opponent is highly defensive? Well, what probably happens is meh. You know, something in the middle, right? Pretty meh. You're, you're kind of like lazy baby here. Um, in, and how meh this is is really dependent upon the level of the defense, right? If it's such that you hit, you have your offensive unit, you're all excited, you got your hammer, and it attacks their anvil, and this is true in any game, and you still do some, so see the previous thing I said about partial credit, right, where it doesn't get reduced to zero, where you still achieve something, you kill some models, you damage the monster, some, okay. It's not great, just meh, but it could be good. But when nothing happens, that's not great. Now, let's go to the worst situation. Let's make it really real. You are playing highly defensively and your opponent is playing highly defensively. What happens? Yep, that, that is what happens. This is really the recipe for tedium. Because what's going on, what's really happening moment to moment in the game is that you and your opponent are spending a lot of time rolling, investing thought, investing emotion. Your life, the most important resource you have that you can never get back, you have invested that in to achieve nothing. Zero things happen as a result of all of your effort, right? So if you've ever played like... Um, two very slow defensive armies in Warhammer against each other, or two decks that rely on counterspelling everything and you know, getting through with like a slight one damage creature or something against each other. Uh, or here's the best example I can think of. Most people who are watching this have probably played an MMO. If you've ever played a thoroughly defensive tank, okay, and fought against, in say, like a PvP situation, another thoroughly defensive tank, to where you are both doing nothing to each other, just forever, right? This is the kind of thing that, like, will often result in death from boredom. When it's like 10, 15, 20 minutes real time of fighting the opponent, and you're both still at 70% life probably just pull off and go do something else with your time. So what does this mean for Warhammer? Well, I think what it means when we think of, of Warhammer and, and what we would want to see in the game is that defense, we, we have these sort of cross incentives. Defense is always the most valuable thing because it completely stops your opponent's plans. If you ward save, if you do whatever, their plans stop. Their spell doesn't cast, their unit doesn't kill you, the wound doesn't land, whatever, right? Your unit doesn't run, I don't care. Whatever it is that's a defensive measure. It's stopping your opponent's plans. Unfortunately, 
that same thing, when it goes just a little too far, becomes really, really offensive to our sensibilities. And I can prove it to you. If you disagree with me right now, I'm going to prove it to you. Here we go. If everybody remembers the Wood Elf Evasion Armies that there was a big uproar over, well, that's the most defensive of possible armies. Really, the best way to survive a fight, the most defensive thing you can do, is simply not get in the fight. Be somewhere else. Right? And uh, they were very good at that. And that evasion game was highly frustrating to people. But that is the simply an incredibly defensive play. Right? How about the gun line? You're going to sit on the back line, and you're going to shoot him, and you're going to shoot him, and you're going to shoot him. In this case, it feels like I'm talking about something offensive. It's big cannons firing off. But really, it's a very defensive army. Think of like your dwarven gun line really being the classic example that is optimal line. How about your uh, how about your impenetrable one-up, overtly tough, uh, you know, demigriffs or or similar sort of monster cab or one-up wall from the empire or whatever, right? Where you can just throw an inordinate amount of offense into them and nothing happens. And as proof in the pudding of that. Here's a nice little chart. Now, this is actually from 40k, but, but some of the math certainly works for, for uh, Warhammer as well. So that top red line, that's what a 2-plus re-rollable armor save looks like. Now, in 40k, this is assuming, of course, that it's not like AP2, right? In that regard, you have a... Look at that first roll. On your first roll, you have almost a 100% chance for nothing to happen. Now, statistically, over six rolls, you drop to about 85%. So that means you've had six wounds caused to you. And how many one-up re-rollable armor saves were floating around and, and are still can be gotten to in Ninth Age or something like that, right? What that means is every six wounds they take, there's about a 15% chance that one of them actually causes damage. But there's an 85% chance over those six wounds that just nothing happens. Now that's a lot of effort to amount to nothing, right? That kind of like high defense, ward saves, right? The, 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 the most criminal, uh, when, when you can get ward saves very low. That is the kind of thing that just immediately goes and makes the game unfun because if you're the, if, if either you, if you're playing offensive, can't achieve your goals. Or you, if you're playing defensive, you get into a long, slow, drawn-out game where one, where one bad luck roll, not skill, because what we're talking about here is the math has hedged as such that now all that can intervene is luck, more or less. Not that you can't somehow skill your way out of it. I shouldn't say never. I'm saying you're pushing it toward where, where luck is going to be the thing that, that wins the day. So what's my conclusion statement? My conclusion is what is the best offense? Offense. That's right. Superman agrees. Look at that. I don't even know what that is. But that is the most ridiculous. That's the amount of offense. Offense just sort of can achieve its goal. Now, none of this is meant to bash on players who enjoy defensive play. Much is more a thing about game design. If it is game designers or when you're thinking about your game, you have to be very careful about how much you let defense get stacked, how much you let entire uh, plans revolve around simply being defensive. Because the more that happens, the more easily you can get yourself into very negative experiences for your players. There you go. Hope you enjoy. Uh, as always, appreciate you watching. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Click the like button down there below if you like it. And as always, We'll see you next time.